Crossovers in general happen because of money. But when they're done right, they can produce fun and exciting ideas that bring multiple audiences together. A crossover can make you interested in something new and exciting, adding new gameplay to a game you love and adding a lasting impression of a fun time. It could also be bad. So I've created a little guy to help measure how good a crossover can be. Introducing the Fish Machine. It grades crossovers based on five criteria. Fighting. Fighting games settle those character battles that used to happen in the CBR forums. If it's a fighting game, it will get bonus points. Integration. Does the crossover incident bring fun and exciting changes to its new environment, or is it yet another cosmetic skin? Surprise. Mountain Dew working with a first person shooter isn't surprising. Mountain Dew working with Sea of Thieves to make a Dew themed tall tale will be the essence of what? Hell yeah, what? Corporate. Does it smell like someone in a business suit heard about it on Clubhouse and wants to get a piece of the metaverse? Corporate crossovers feel like synergistic moves from the shareholders rather than wish fulfillment for the fans. If it feels like John Business is telling me to do it, it's losing points. History. Crossovers can change the course of history in the best of ways and the worst of ways. Now that the fish machine has analyzed all the crossovers, we can put them into a tiered list, which is the internet's favorite way of processing information. D tier crossovers. This tier feels like getting a Pepsi when you're clearly asking for a Coke and you ask multiple times. Case in point. This crossover from 2011 tried to make Uncharted 3 fans go to a subway for early access to multiplayer. The surprise factor was pretty high because really nobody saw this crossover coming. But why would they? The only brand integration with Nathan Drake doing a $5 foot long taunt in game. They could have had him at least climb a rickety ladder made of Italian urban cheese rolls. Extra points were gained for this being the first and last time Subway worked with Uncharted. Mario versus Link. Naruto versus Goku. Martial arts legend Bruce Lee versus noted asshole Conor McGregor. Who wants this? Some suit from EA wanted this. I don't know. Businessman. Usually these crossovers use fictional characters, but in 2014, EA decided to take a different approach. Bruce Lee never did MMA, but he's an ultimate fighter. So this scores points for fighting and integration. Too bad this crossover just can't escape the soul-crushing corporateness of licensing a dead person's likeness for branded content. C tier is primarily surface level crossovers that have little to no memorability. Sure, they might have missed the mark, but they don't feel like a desperate attempt to sell sandwiches. Sweet, sweet skins are the most common type of crossover in video games. As much as I love the beanification of characters like 2B and Alex, the surprise wears off after a while. It feels like someone is wearing their favorite t-shirt every time I see it. I get it, you like Mr. Beast. They're typically integrated pretty well. The Tron Guy skin dropped during the 80s inspired season four. Skins from indie games such as Gato Roboto, Untitled Goose Game, and My Friend Pedro decreased the core business levels a bit. Fortnite crossover skins are all over the place, from Sarah Connor to Travis Scott, but all characters in the game still have the same base skeleton. Each part of the skin, such as the body, head, and backpack, have to work within those limits. Batman and a werewolf have the same walk. You can't have an Air Bud skin because he doesn't walk on two legs. The dog can shoot from mid-court and still can't play in Fortnite. Point stopped. Sony's attempt at a smash light brought in beloved characters from PlayStation's IP to beat the living shit out of each other. I don't think anybody asked if a Killzone guy could beat Dante, but we got it anyway. While the game felt like a crass corporate amalgamation of Sony's greatest hits, each character had a unique feel. Kratos takes big meaty swings with a blaze of chaos, Harappa has music based attacks, and that kid from Ape Escape hits fools with his net. As far as branded integration goes, this was pretty thoughtful. But alas, it wasn't enough to leave any sort of impact on gaming culture at large.
While many C-tier crossovers may be forgotten as time goes on, the next set might stick around a little bit more. B-tier is composed of really cool crossovers that didn't really set the gaming world on fire, but may have provided some great memories for you and your friends. Halo's notorious Warthog was added to Forza Horizon 4's AutoVista feature, where you could hear a car pervert describe it with excruciating detail. The M12 uses a dependable, low-profile, 12-liter hydrogen-injected ICE power plant. The Halo Mobile was in the previous Forza games, but in Forza Horizon 4, you could drive across virtual England as the Chief, with Halo sound effects and banshees chasing you to a landing zone. Points for surprise! and points for integration because of excellent Warthog handling. Another Halo-flavored crossover is Spartan 458's appearance in Dead or Alive 4. It's the first time that Microsoft added a character based on the Halo series to a fighting game. Spartan 458 looks precisely like Master Chief, but isn't because Bungie and some nerds are very protective of Halo's lore. So instead, they called an audible and created a character who was never seen again. It's very corporate, but sort of surprising and answers the question, can a Spartan fight without a gun? I know that B tier was pretty short, but from here on out, it's just straight bangers. A tier crossovers understand the power of a crossover. They know that a good relationship requires work and mutual respect. These typically score majorly high in integration, history, and surprise. Corporate points are typically very low, but exceptions can be made, like our first entry, Marvel vs. Capcom. The Marvel vs. Capcom partnership was created to keep Marvel Comics from going bankrupt by allowing it to license its characters to Capcom for money. It started in 1994 with X-Men Children of the Atom, then evolved into the Marvel vs. Capcom series, which continued to escalate as the two companies engaged in corporate synergy. The games have had a huge impact. Marvel vs. Capcom 2 is one of the progenitors of the 3 on 3 battles we see in games such as Skullgirls and Dragon Ball Fighters. But when Disney bought Marvel in 2009, it brought a more corporate edge to the character selection. They removed the stable of X-Men characters and brought in more temple characters from the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Listen, you just gotta bring Storm back and I'm right back in the saddle. Right there. Dead by Daylight brought in a bunch of iconic villains from horror games and films. And they weren't just skins. They were fully developed characters with their own unique abilities. Let's look at how Resident Evil's Tyrant was integrated. The big guy doesn't have a rocket launcher, but you could use his gross tentacle to whip survivors and infect them with blue goo. You could also get your ghost face on in Raccoon City's police station, which the developer tried to make as accurate as possible. Unfortunately, IP rights are limited, so some of these characters could disappear as time goes on. Points are taken off due to the fluctuation of playable characters over time. Monster Hunter's Final Fantasy update included the Cactar, Dragoon armor, and a Moogle skin for your Palico. This crossover scored points for thoughtful integration. The Behemoth feels like a completely different fight than what Monster Hunter players are used to, more akin to an actual raid boss in an MMO. Monster Hunter World's monsters telegraph attacks through tell animations. The behemoth covers Elder's resets with magic attacks like Meteor and Carp... Char... Carbidus. The behemoth covers Elder's resets with magical attacks like Meteor and Charybdis, bringing it more in line with its Final Fantasy counterpart. The attacks require coordination to avoid specific moves, like the Eclectic Meteor. Meanwhile, in Final Fantasy XIV, Rathalos becomes a boss monster with raid boss tendencies, including different phases of the fight and some Monster Hunter-like tells for when the fireball is coming. Also, pelting a Rathalos with ranged magic is hella satisfying. Both crossovers were a huge surprise to fans. The games aren't similar, but they mesh perfectly. S-tier crossovers fundamentally change gaming forever and should be the blueprint of all crossovers to come. Warner. Snake showing up in Brawl was the beginning of S-tier crossovers in Smash. After the original Super Smash Brothers broke down barriers between Nintendo's worlds, the conversation turned to who would be next to Smash. Fans speculated about third-party characters, but nobody was ready for Snake. Snake's appearance thoughtfully integrated his canonical skills and tools, and opened the door for future guests. Mixing Disney and JRPG elements seemed suspect, but it turned out to be simple and
and clean. Disney has had a long history of flip-flopping in games. In a matter of years, they went from Epic Mickey to just making branded Candy Crush games. But the Kingdom Hearts series has never wavered. From its inception in the early aughts, every game has felt like a surprise. And all of Disney's acquisitions over the years, from Marvel to Star Wars to Pixar, have laid new ground for even more worlds to explore in Kingdom Hearts. If there's a Kingdom Hearts 4, we could finally duel a shirtless Kylo Ren. Crossovers are at their best when they bring new gameplay to a series you love. One of the main reasons I got into Capcom fighting games was seeing Cyclops shoot Captain Commando with his laser beams in Marvel vs. Capcom 2. I'm getting those same feelings when I look at Nicktoon All-Star Brawl. A bunch of characters I do know and don't know, but they all come together to remind me that I really don't have cable anymore. Here's hoping to another S-tier crossover. Nigel Thornberry mains, please stand for the national anthem. Ah! <laughs>